our great and mighty God. Amen. The source of our joy and the joy of the Lord is our strength. the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise we were the beggars Jesus is talking to his disciples. Verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Lord, thank you. We have your word. You are the way. You've made a way that we can be with the Father. We, can, we walk in fear, we walk in awe, but we can also walk as a Father and say, I'm the Father. 
Papa. We love you. And we look forward to that day that we will freely be able to come and bow at your throne, Father. And what the angels cry out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you today that you've made a way. We don't have to know the way like we would look at a map to know how to get from here to there. Lord, we follow you as our leader. We follow you as our source. We follow you as the one who is the way. Hallelujah, Lord. Stop. 
The beautiful name of Jesus. The wonderful name of Jesus. And the powerful name of Jesus. On which we can call out the name that we are healed by. The name that we are saved by. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're here. name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of
By your name we can be healed. By your stripes we're healed. By your name we're saved. Lord, we come today. We come today seeking you. We come today, Lord, to be healed. To receive a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit. We come today with hurts and brokenness. We lay those things down at the altar. Sometimes we just don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. We don't know where to go. But our, but our hearts always direct us back to you. We come to the end of ourselves. You are our source. You are our healer. Hallelujah, Lord. 
Lord, use this time as we are healed to prepare us. There's work to be done. There are people out there that need to hear your word, that need to hear your name, that need to know about you. So, Lord, don't let us be the church that just sits on our laurels and waits for the day that we come to the sweet by and by. But, Lord, let us be healed. Let us be strengthened and let us be equipped to take your name take your word to the world around us so that when we we do have that day that we stand before your throne Lord there are more and more saints standing with us hallelujah
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Bear the cross as you wait for your crown. People like that concept. I want somebody else to take care of everything for me. Um, God's taking care of all that we need. Amen. Amen. You need to see me. This Thursday, the 11th of November, at 11. AM, a combined call of guard representing all military services will execute, present arms at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. The laying of a presidential wreath and a bugler playing caps marks our nation's tribute to its war dead. This ceremony takes place every year in three countries. Those who have given their last full measure of devotion and service to their representative countries. In London, it happens at the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month at Windsor Abbey. In Paris, it happens at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month at our day trail. In the United States, it happens at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month at our day. It began in 1926. 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month is when the armistice for World War I supposed to happen. It was started to honor those who died in World War I. In 1954, it was changed to honor all veterans, both dead and living, all those who had died in service to our country and to those who have served in defense of our country, our life, our liberty. One million three hundred and fifty four thousand six hundred and sixty four plus have died in the uniform of this nation. One million four hundred and ninety eight thousand two hundred and forty plus have been wounded mangled in defense of our liberties, in defense protecting so that we could sit here this morning. There's 50 nations on the earth where we can't sit like this open and in public. There's 40,000 and 31 plus still listed as missing. Two million eight hundred and ninety two thousand three hundred and thirty two soldiers, veterans have been wounded, missing, and killed, protecting, providing for our national pledge which is one nation under God. And for our national motto, as declared by Congress, both of them, in God we trust. I'd like all of our, our veterans to stand. If you're a veteran of any service in, the, in there, please stand. Patrick! Come on in. Stand right there. Turn. If 
you're near one, turn and, and touch them or re reach your hand to them. We're going to pray for them. Lord, we honor these men and women who, Lord, women, men and women, who have served in this nation's forces. They've gone so, Lord, to protect, to provide a liberty we so cherish. They have put life and limb in harm's way for us. Lord, your word declares in John that greater love has not a person than that they lay down their lives for another. Lord, these men took that chance. They stepped up. And we honor you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your service. We honor your integrity, your fortitude. And we bless you. Jesus' name. Everybody who agreed said, Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Do you know that of the 12 original, 12 of the 13 original colonies incorporated all 10? of the commandments into their civil and criminal codes. President John Adams, the second president of the United States, stated this, the law given from Sinai was a civil law and a municipal code as well as a moral and religious code. There are laws essential, these are laws essential to the existence of men in society and most of which have been enacted by every nation which ever professed any code of laws oh by the way you know you ever heard of the American Bible Society that was enacted by a motion of Congress started by an act of Congress the American Bible Society and John Adams the president was its first leader George Washington said that a man cannot properly govern without God in the Bible. Patrick Henry, of the famous line, give me liberty or give me death, was a devout, spirit-filled believer. He was the first governor of Virginia. And he's probably breathing a sigh of relief in heaven. I'm sure he was at heaven's door saying, let me out. First governor of Virginia. Member of the Continental Congress. Which drafted the Constitution. He was one of the main fighters incessantly for the Bill of Rights. This is what he stated before Congress and before the Continental Congress when making and arguing for the Bill of Rights and in the Constitution. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you hear people say, well, it was just freedom of religion for whatever. No, there weren't. It wasn't for that. Please listen to one of the framers. Please listen to the one who was at every meeting arguing for the Bill of Rights. Arguing in the Constitution. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not a, by religionists. All kinds of religion. Oh, they just, whatever floats your boat. No. It was founded but by Christians 
not by religions and not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now here's something you may not know about Patrick Henry. Him and Morrison of the original framers, fighters, and arguers, and people who worked on the Constitution and worked on the Bill of Rights are only the two, the two only who refused to sign the Bill of Rights. I mean, to sign the Constitution. Patrick Henry wouldn't sign the Constitution. He wanted more Bill of Rights. He hated the fact, he felt that the Constitution gave too much power to the federal government in Washington. At that time, it would have been Philadelphia, New York. He says that they're, they're going to abuse that power. Can we call him a prophet at this point? He refused to vote for the Constitution on the grounds he gave too much power to the federal government. He wanted more rights for the states and for the individual given to them by God. Now, I've been privileged to participate and speak at a number of military graveside services. In Bishop, when a deceased person was a veteran, who had served the country in a time of war, the veterans of foreign affairs, foreign wars, would take a rifle and they'd put it upside down and put a helmet on it when you got near the place that we were doing the ceremony. And it's because during World War II, so many Americans were killed that they didn't have time to identify or bury them all, so the survivors of a battle would dig a shallow grave and put the man's rifle on top of that and then put his helmet on so that the companies that came behind, the grave diggers, be able to find them and bring them back and give them a proper burial. Every military funeral I've ever attended played taps. You ever heard taps played? It's almost got a haunting sound, doesn't it? I'll tell you the story of Taps. It's a true story. I want you to know the true story, and I want you to tell you how it got started. It all began in 1862 during the Civil War, when a Union Army Captain, Robert Ellencom, was with his men near Harrison's Landing in Virginia. Confederate Army was on the other side of the narrow strip of land. After the fight and during the night, Captain Ellencom heard the moans of a soldier who lay severely wounded still on the battlefield. Not knowing whether it was a Union or a Confederate soldier, the captain decided to risk his life and bring this stricken soldier back to medical attention. Crawling on his stomach too dark, the captain reached the stricken soldier, grabbed him by the collar, and began to pull him back towards the encampment so the young man, the soldier, could receive medical attention. Come back to that. Second Timothy two, three, and four. You feel, you therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When any one of these men signed up to serve in the military, they raised their right hand. And they took a vow to defend the Constitution in this country. By the way, that vow doesn't have an ex expiration date on it. And we thank you for continuing. When you and I became citizens of heaven, 
children of God, born again. When Jesus Christ became our Savior and Lord, we became soldiers of God. Amen? We live in a time where the church is supposed to be a pacifist. Do you realize that that's an absolute lie of the enemy? That's a lie. Oh, the church just needs to pray and stay. They don't have any... I mean, entire denominations will tell you you're not supposed to get involved in politics. Then what did God give you that gift for? You must therefore... You therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier. We need to recognize, the fact, folks, that we are soldiers in the army of God. Amen? And there's no going back on that. No one engaged in warfare entangles themselves with the affairs of the life, but they, that they may please the person who enlisted them to be a soldier, who enlisted us as Jesus Christ, and it was his blood, and Pastor Joe's going to come up in a few minutes, and he's going to serve communion. Jesus Christ brought us into the family of God. For we do not war or wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. First of all, establish the fact that we are in the army of God. We are soldiers. Well, I can't pick up a rifle. I don't want to shoot a rifle. Then you can pray and you can vote and you can get involved. We're not talking about insurrection or that phony insurrection on January 6th because that wasn't an insurrection. That's what it's saying. The reality is that we're talking about making a difference. For wherever two or three agree on anything in earth, so shall it be done. Agree in my name. We're soldiers. The war's already won. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. Folks, those heavenly places are all around us. If you don't believe in the dynamic, dynamic, if you don't believe in the demonic, my friend, you better wake up. Because it's all around us. Greater is he that's within us than he that is in the world. But we, we better recognize the fact that we are soldiers in the army of God. And that we need to pray. We need to put on the whole armor of God. But then we need to do more than just that. We need to get involved. How do we honor a veteran? One of the things we need to stand up for our country. Don't let people trash it. Don't let people trash it with this word. Every time you allow someone to trash it or you trash our great nation, you dishonor, disgrace, and degrade a veteran service. God gave us this great nation, and he's kept it. We can do hours of sermons on how God, in his miracles, produced this nation. It's in God we trust. Loved ones, do not allow anyone to disrespect a veteran. Anyone who calls themselves and proclaims themselves a child of the Lord Jesus Christ should stand up. Have we made mistakes? Absolutely. Have we done things wrong? Absolutely. Have we done immoral? Absolutely. But that doesn't ruin us as a nation. Does it? See, the reality is that God forgives us time and time and time and time again. We also, as a nation, have produced more missionaries than in all the other nations on the face of the earth. We've also produced more hospitals outside of our nation than more nation, any nation has done on the face of the earth. 
We believe in compassion. We are one nation under God. Endure your hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A good soldier of Jesus Christ does not allow someone to trash the nation. This sick, demonic, wrong teaching. What's it called? C critical CRT is bogus. It's do- designed by the demonic to divide us and to divide and shame people. It's completely wrong. Oh, there's parts of it that are slanted that might have some smell of accuracy, but it's intended to divide, it's intended to demean, it's intended to shame. It's intended to make a whole group of people feel like they're victims all their lives. And it's intended to make a whole other group of people be ashamed for how God made them. As Christians in the Lord's army, soldiers, it's not a, it's not a colloquial, it's not just a, a run by that we're a soldier. God said we're his soldiers. God said we're the watchmen on the wall. As we honor our veterans, we need to come to the reality that we're called warriors too. How do we start in our war life? We accept Jesus Christ, we read his word, and then we pray. Nothing happens without prayer. And nothing good that is. Why do you think they call them prayer warriors? Because things happen when we pray in agreement in the name of Jesus. Our veterans risk everything in service to this country. So don't allow anyone to disrespect them, their service, or this nation one nation and the God. Let's go back to our story of Pat's. It's night. He's crawled out into no man's land and there's a person moaning and crying. He has no idea what unit the kid's from, no idea what side the person's on, the person is hurting. He grabs him and he crawls back to his side so the young man can receive medical aid. When he finally reaches his own lines, he discovers that it actually is Confederate soldier. He lights a little lamp and he turns the soldier over and he looks at him. It's a Confederate soldier. But now he's dead. Suddenly, his breath is calm. He goes numb. He's in shock. In the dim light, he recognizes the face of the soul as his own son. It was his own son. His son had been studying music in the South when the war broke out. And without telling his father, he enlisted in the Confederate army and went off to fight. How do we honor our veterans? We value our freedoms. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Galatians 5.1 says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Satan is always trying to re-entangle us with rules and regulations and laws. He's always trying to tell us, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. We need to do what the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to do and His Word instructs us to do. The whole book of Galatians is trying to tell them, hey, you don't live under the law. You are free. I 
our veterans gave their all. Christ set us free that we could have life and have it more abundantly. They did it so we could have freedom of speech, freedom to bear arms, freedom to vote, freedom to worship, freedom to assembly, freedom to bring grievance against our government. When you devalue those freedoms, when you don't take advantage of them, you demean the service of the veterans and their sacrifices. If you haven't picked up on it yet, I'm trying to get us to understand we need to mobilize as a unit and soldiers in Christ. We pray first. First John 4, 9. God loved us so much. He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world that we might have life eternal through Him. When, well, I'm just a citizen of heaven. No, you're not. You're a citizen of the United States if you're living here. If you're a member here. You're a citizen here. And you've got obligations in both countries. We need to live a life that displays the glory of God, standing up for what is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want to finish the story of Taps? The following morning, heartbroken, shaken, the captain asked permission of his superiors to give his son a full military funeral, despite the fact of his enemy status. His request was only partially granted. The captain had asked if he could have a group of the military band members play a funeral dirge for his son at the funeral. The request was turned down, as well as the request for an armor guard, honor guard. But they did allow him to have one musician play. Because after all, he was the captain's son. They said he could choose a bugler. And the captain asked the bugler to play a series of musical notes that he had found in his dead son's uniform. This wish was granted and the haunting melody, the tune we now know as taps, used in all military tunes. We need to remember that people have died Nearly two million of them. So that we could be here this morning and worship the Lord Jesus Christ unashamedly, unafraid of our government. Fear is a work of the enemy. The fear wants to silence you. It wants to mask you. It wants to demasculate you. It wants to shut you down. We want you to do what they say to do. Nearly two million people have died that we might serve the rights that we have and live the rights that we have through Jesus Christ. You want to honor veterans this Veterans Day? Ask God how you can get involved and bring us back to that place of one nation. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. What can we do to honor? What can we do to fulfill what God has called us as soldiers of the army of God, we can start by being the best citizens that we can be. Remember, we have dual citizenship, heaven and earth. 
Now you may be thinking, well, what can I do? I I don't know what I can do. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask from God, who is giving to all liberally and not reproaching, and it will be given to you. Ask God. You ever thought about that? Just get down and ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to propagate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ within this country, within my circle, within my house, within my neighborhood? He'll give you some very clever ideas. Most of you know about Devin, who my grandson is named after, the young man who on every Tuesday morning after we met for prayer and a Bible study on how to be a man of God, he would stop at start at the third floor of the forestry building and he would anoint with oil every single desk in that building all the way down. Never once did he join a bowling club. He didn't do any of that. He came to church and he went home. He was our youth pastor for a while. In fact, he was a youth pastor. He passed away. Over 300 people came to his funeral. 36 people accepted Jesus Christ at his funeral. And we talked, and he he doesn't ever remember talking to anybody about salvation on his job. He did the job. He lived the life. And he prayed for them. Ask God what he wants you to do. Matthew 18, and I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. That's a promise of God. That's where the prayer warriors come in. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. James 2, and this is one of my favorites. But someone is going to say, well, you have faith. They have faith. Well, I'll say to them, you have faith and I have works. You show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. See, it's not enough just to pray. Pray is vi- prayer is vital and prayer is the first thing and it's for prayer warriors. But after you get done praying, get up off your knees and get busy doing what God told you to do. Somebody asked Reverend Cho, how did you build the world's largest church? An orphan. Penniless. What did he say? Oh, I just did the room prayed and it all happened. No. And if you've ever watched any of his interviews, he always laughs. I don't know what that is, but he laughs. How did you do it? What's the secret? Oh, hush went over the crowd. Man's got a church, had a church of over a million people. What did he say? What did the poor orphan boy say before he said? He said, I pray and I obey. <laughs> They're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's got to be more to it than that. No. I pray. And I obey. (laughs) You want to see the world changed? Pray and obey. Listen to God. He already has promised He's going to give us whatever we need for life and godliness. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. I'm going to end with this, and then Pastor Joe's going to come and win communion. Ezekiel 33, 6. Ezekiel 33 starts with God talking to Ezekiel. And he's calling him a watchman. My friends, we are watchmen in this nation. This nation was founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. Twelve of the thirteen original colonies absolutely had all ten of the Ten Commandments. Pennsylvania and a couple other colonies, you could not vote or could not hold public office unless you wrote a profession of faith, not in religion, not in Wonka Tonka, not in anything else, but unless you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Again and again and again, people are trying to delude people in this nation to the fact that we are a Christian nation and we were founded on God and we need to wake up and stand up and get in somebody's face because if we're going to honor the veterans who have given their life, the veterans who have given their time, then we need to make sure that which they sacrifice for, we retain. We pray first, then we stand up and say, no, you cannot silence me. No, you cannot do this and you cannot do that. Why did Benjamin Franklin, I mean, why did Patrick Henry not sign the Constitution? He wanted, he, he said right then and there, federal government's got too much power. They're going to try to make more. Again, we can call him a kill. Ezekiel 33, God is talking to Ezekiel. Jerusalem is beginning to, they're doing pretty good. Things are going pretty well. you got a corrupt government. People aren't paying attention to God. He talks about the fact that You've got to let people know there's something going on. I'm not going to put up with it forever. Look what he says. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, that means that the army's coming, trouble's coming, overreach of government, and they don't blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away any of them, that person that is taken away in their iniquity. We need to turn back to righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is its reproach. See, the tragedy in this nation, we exalt unrighteousness. We really do. I said something the other day that there's 51 genders now. And somebody corrected me and said, no, there isn't. There's 57 official genders. I have to redo my passport for the third time. If you get a passport or renew your passport, they will ask you, do you identify as no gender? And which puts, they will put X. No, I think I've got that one figured out. Righteousness exalts a nation and sin is its We need to stand up for righteousness. Amen? We need to begin to stand up and talk up. We need not to be silent. Earlier I said that for all too many churches, it's a work of the enemy. I don't believe it. I, I don't doubt it for one second. Satan wants to silent believers. They don't want us involved in politics. They don't want us involved in the school board. They don't want us involved because that way they get their demonic agenda. And a lot of school boards and a lot of what's going on is pure demonic agenda. So church, if we're going to honor veterans, we need to understand that we are veterans. We're working for the kingdom of God. We're soldiers in God's kingdom. And we need to stand up. Ask God what he wants you to do. It already says if you'd lack, ask. I'll give you. He's talking to Ezekiel and he says, Now, if that person sees what's going on, they see the destruction coming. And they don't do anything about it. They don't cry the warning. They don't stand up and shout the warning. Then the people are going to die in their iniquity. But I'm going to count, I'm going to make you. But that person is taken away in his iniquity. But the blood of that person I will require at the watchman's hand. We have a responsibility, a duty, a requirement to be silent no more. We have a nation that needs righteous people in love to stand up after praying and say no more. This is wicked and wrong. We are as deluded a nation as I can possibly believe. We have a four-star general
who has outdoor plumbing who calls himself a woman heading up our health what's his official title her official his no his official no he, he is what is it surgeon general a four-star general who can't figure out no it's demonic and twisted by the way I still have freedom of speech and I still have a brain well part of a brain to work with probably more of a brain than others I will do it. I'll stop right there but the oh you can't talk about no no I'm not talking about politics I'm talking about sin let's get this understood Saints this is sin when I took my first psychiatry class, my first counseling, excuse me, class in 1972 in college, homosexuality, bestiality, pedophilia were all labeled as mental disorders. And you realize they're not. They're preference. If the watchman on the wall doesn't shout the alarm and the people get carried away, the watchman on the wall, God will require an account. Folks, we're a watchman on the wall. We need to love. We need to pray. We don't need to point fingers. You don't need to tell anybody they're a sinner. They know they're a sinner. You just don't agree with them that they're not a sinner. Oh, I just how I know it's not. Talk to the hand. Problem is we argue too much. We need to pray a little more. And then we need to stand up and get involved. Reverend Tro said, I pray and I obey. <laughs> I don't think we can do any more to honor veterans than to pray and to beg. Amen? And start using the gifts that God has given us. Start using the talents that He's given us. To cry out for this nation. Pastor Joe. This might be a little, come on ahead, Pastor Joe. It might be a little more political than some of you are used to, but the reality is that this is Veterans Day, and we are a nation that no longer honors our veterans if we at this church will. And then we will recognize that all of us are veterans. We're all engaged in the of Jesus Christ. Come on up, Pastor Joe. I will get down and shut up. Worship team, come forward. What a savior, isn't he wonderful? Aren't you glad? I want to read you from the uh, Living Bible. And uh, it just worded it a little different. The passage in First Corinthians. But this is what the Lord himself has said about this table. And I have passed it on to you as you before, that on the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, 
take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new agreement between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're retelling the message of the Lord's death and that he died for you. <laughs> when I was a little boy, at church, I got the idea I'd like to be a preacher because I'd better stand up there and yell than sit out there and be quiet. But that isn't why I'm, I'm here, though. Now. The Lord had other ideas. He gave me a call gave me the desire of my heart. And, but um, I want to ask you a question. When was it in your life that you gave your heart to the Lord? Just think about that. I was about nine years old. How many were children when you gave your heart to the How many of you were teenagers? Twenties and thirties. Forties and fifties. Sixty and above? Well, you almost didn't make it. Overwhelmingly, when you were children, you know it speaks to me that we used to have Sunday school that were packed with kids. I mean, we could get Sunday school started here, you know, teaching children so they could. That's the only way you're going to change a generation is by raising them up. Raising them up. Well, in the Old Testament times, they called communion the Passover. It wasn't with a cup and a piece of bread like it is today. And um, they had to sacrifice a lamb. And uh, sacrifice it and collect its blood to present to the Lord as the price for the forgiveness of that infraction that they were and you say, well, why? Why the blood? Well, because the scripture says without the blood, there's no remission of sin. In the New Testament, John was baptizing people and one day he saw this gentleman approaching him and he said behold it's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and Christ became that sacrifice and he shed his blood and in this scripture he with bread and broke it and he said this is my body which is broken for you and 
and this cup represents my blood, which has been given for the remission of your sin. The purpose of Christ's death was to bring salvation to you and to me and to the rest of the world. I said I was about nine years old when I gave my heart to the Lord. You know, that means I have about 70 years of communion services under my belt. <coughs> <coughs> Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because this is like a Passover for you. This is an anniversary of a day that you made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And you know, communion Sundays are the best attended Sundays in our churches. They are. The people want to be back. But see, that's what it is. This is a celebration of life that you and I enjoy that our country is in desperate need of. We need to pastors hit the nail on the head. And we need to become a congregation that really prays and he proceeds to our nation and starts to do something more than we've ever done before. Among the churches, Christian churches in this city, so that we can be responsible for the city that we live in. We can't do it for everyone. We can do it in this place. Get pastors together and Let's go through this stuff and let's start doing it in our churches and let's start reaching out and filling it up with children and young people and do up whatever we can to reach those people for Jesus Christ. Every time I partake of communion, I make a declaration. That Christ died for me. That He's my Savior and my Lord. And I'll serve Him for the thing I do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share together emblems of your broken body and your blood that you shed. Father, begin you're beginning something today in this church and out of this church it's going to impact others. And Lord Jesus, we pray that if we partake of these emblems that have brought such life to us represent the light that's been brought to us. But Lord, you would pour out your spirit upon us in incredible ways and the gifts of the spirit so they can begin to operate in ways like never before. And the Lord, lives will be touched and this will become a center, O Lord, of freedom for people who are bound. We give you praise for that. We receive this bread and this wine and give you thanks for making it possible for us to have that divine nature to be provided for us. in Jesus' name. Jesus became the Lamb of God and 
you know what the scripture says in Romans 12, chapter 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you possess your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your living sacrifice. We're to be a sacrifice. What's that going to mean? What is that going to require of you? Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord. What do you want you to do? He'll give you an answer. He really will. And then, after you pray, you obey. (laughs) (laughs) Right? That was great, Pastor. Let's do it. Okay? Thank mm-hmm. you.